Let's talk about our introduction to code diagnostics. We're going to use an OBD1 and OBD2 code for P0440. It's an example of how the diagnostic change slightly with EVAP monitors in different generations of, of EVAP. The, uh, we'll start with this 440 OBD1 code of a GM example. This code indicates no flow was detected by the flow sensor when the PER solenoid was energized. It has a slightly different meaning for OBD2. But we're not going to worry about that now. This is going to give us a chance to cover all of the basic functions we need to do with EVAP and how they function. And so we're going to walk through these functions to show what's necessary for normal EVAP operation and get around to testing this code P440 for code 1. Start foil, as we all have said before, manifold vacuum pulls canister vapor into the intake manifold. Now, there's two situations can happen when we do this. We can have manifold, manifold vacuum pulling through lots of fuel vapors if the canister has been saturated, or it can pull through mostly fresh air if it's not, and we'll talk about the strategies necessary to make this work properly. But the basics are the hoses must connect the vacuum to the canister, and we're going to be using a solenoid, a purge valve, as for a better term, now, it may be called the purge solenoid, purge valve, canister purge, vacuum switching valve, uh, vapor pressure monitor, whatever. It's simply this. It's going to control the vacuum and only apply vacuum to the canister when we want it to, and the computer is going to energize it to do this. And we're going to talk about the conditions when we would do this and talk about the codes we'll get. But for canister operation, let's look at the canister. Restrictions in the canister or hoses can prevent normal flow, which might give us a code for low flow. The canister could be clogged because it's fuel full of water or debris. This is something we see occasionally in flood situations where the canister has been underwater and it's fully saturated water. It's very hard to pull the vapor through. may even call misfire codes sometimes. So don't ignore that. Now, there's a, in this particular case for GM, there's a, plow, a purge flow sensor. It opens a switch when vacuum is applied to the purge system, indicating we have purge. And that's the extent of the diagnostics. Is there a purge? Yes or no? Only major leaks, restrictions, and disconnected hoses can set this. There is no fuel cap monitor because it's not there. Let's talk about some of the other components we're going to look at here. Here's the specifics on our canister purge vacuum switch. As you can see, the top of the vacuum canister, canister vacuum switch is connected to pin A, which goes up to B plus to the AC fuse. The bottom goes to the PCM. Now, what this indicates to us, we look at a diagram like this. Obviously, it's going to be hot. It says at the top that B plus is going to be hot in run or bub test or start. So in every condition except engine off, we're going to have B plus on pin A. Pin B is going to be used by the computer in pin 66 to energize it. It's ground enabled, low side driver. We're going to supply ground to turn that on. And we're going to talk about the diagnostics later on when we do that. We also have a test port which provides access to the purge system for testing. Now the purge port's there and you've got some very specific rules for that test port. The first thing you're going to understand is when we say manifold vacuum and purge vacuum, we're talking about very low amounts of vacuum. One inch of water is 13.6 inches. 13.6 inches of water is equal to one inch of mercury. And if we have one PSI, that's 27.7 inches of water. That's equal to two inches of mercury approximately. So when we look at your cell, we're talking here on purge using six to nine inches of water. That means if you were looking at a, a vacuum gauge like we're used to using, a mere flicker of the needle would indicate we have full vacuum. So our using of a standard vacuum gauge is useless here. We'll show you how to use scan data and other things when we get into more sophisticated systems. Let's talk about this test port again. It says we are only allowed one PSI maximum regulated pressure. By the way, notice we have reverse threads on this. 
don't damage the Schrader valve when you take it out. You're going to have to take it out, hook up your smoke machine, and other things for testing. So this is important. Let me make show you what one inch of pressure does. Remember, this is one pound per square inch of surface area. Pounds per square inch is the air pressure. The force is one, par one PSI times the square inches of the area you were talking about. Let's make it a small area. Let's say we're going to apply it to a 10 by 10 area of a fuel tank. That's going to give us 100 pounds of force. What if we made that much larger because we have a pretty good sized gas tank, four or 500 square inches. We're talking about four or 500 pounds of force for one PSI applied. Go to two PSI, you've got a half a ton. It's very easy to rupture a fuel tank if you use shop air or something. So apply this force to all those square inches in that tank, and you've got quite a bit of force. It's very high. Do not apply vacuum or air pressure to the test port because it can damage the tank. We had cases of tanks rupturing years ago because the, the vent plugged up and uh, kept it from doing it. Now I'm going to show you something, what pounds per square inch does. You take the total surface area and then multiply it by pounds per square inch. Now, a cleaning crew in England thought that a vacuum would help evaporate any fumes in this tank as they entered it. This car was crushed by a manifold vacuum, by vacuum. Nothing compared to manifold vacuum. We're going to go in here and we're going to activate this movie and you're going to see this crush this pump, this pump crush this car. Notice there's a line there. It's going to high volume pump. What's going to happen? The vacuum crushed that train car. Wasn't that many inches of vacuum. However, look at the, square, the large area. So don't think that applying a few, take a little shop air and apply it, wouldn't do harm. It could do harm. The PCM has specific strategies about running purge. We're going to run purge in conjunction with fuel delivery. We can't just turn purge on dump fuel vapor in, and hope the car runs okay. We're going to be more specific than that. The initial purge opening will limit the amount of vapor flow until the PCM can correct for it. How is it going to correct? Well, as we do this, the PCM is going to monitor short-term fuel trim to determine the vapor concentration coming out of the canister. Remember, this vapor could be fuel vapor or it could be fresh air. We don't know what's in the canister until we look at it and try so purge must not cause an engine performance problem. That would be a real bad thing to have a performance problem because you're purging. Back in the early days, before OBD-1, we saw that in some of the systems we had. We had saturated canisters. It turned the solenoid off and on, and we got situations like that. Now, the PCM is going to lower the duty cycle when concentration is high and then increase it as the vapors get less. So normal purge is going to take place after the engine's warmed up. That's usually 140 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the manufacturer. It's going to stop when we get to wide open throttle. So we're not going to use purge on a cold engine or in a wide open throttle when fuel control is critical. We're going to use it mainly at light lows crews. The short term fuel trim will shift negative to correct for rich mixture if we have a lot of fuel vapor. So if fuel vapor is present, we're going to go and move short-term fuel trim rich negative to compensate for this rich. It's going to make adjustments to compensate for fuel vapors from the canister. And if it's air, fuel, the fuel trim will go positive to compensate for air vapors. Remember, we're going to pull fresh air through to get that canister good and clean so it's there. You're going to find the duty cycle increase as the fuel vapors are cleaned out of the canister, and you'll see that we have actual test drives. Let's talk about leak check enabling. Leak checking is totally separate from purge. They have nothing to do with each other. Purge is the function defined in 1973, pulling fresh air through the canister to remove any vapors that have been stored. Leak checking came in OBD-1, improved with OBD-2, time to tighten things up, and even improved more when we went to enhanced 20,000s leak check. So we have a lot of vehicle conditions that are necessary before we can do an accurate measurements of leaks. That's because fuel is evaporating in the tank and it increases fuel pressure, particularly when it's testing 
on warm fuel. Warm fuel evaporates faster, creates more pressure than coal fuel. So when we do this, we have a situation called enabling conditions. They're necessary because some of this condition can make leak detections difficult and unreliable. So we can't do it just at the whim. We have to have specific rules. Now the vacuum decay system of pulling a weak vacuum on a seal system and, me and measure the time it takes for a leak down of the vacuum is typical of early systems. Over the 1996, 1999, and it's still used even today. But this requires we know how much fuel is being evaporated. To do that, we have to compensate for fuel temperature during this and change the time required for vacuum decay. Warm fuel, the time requirement to look at it will be much shorter than it will be on coal fuel because we know that the fuel is adding to it. Now, let's talk more about this situation. We're going to pull a weak vacuum, check for a leak down. We're going to have to time the whole thing. We're going to time it because it will take a shorter time. Warm fuel has a higher evaporative rate than coal fuel. The PCM uses the assumption that the fuel tank pressure temperature is approximately the same as coolant temperature after the vehicle has been setting four to eight hours without engine operation. That four to eight hours depends on ambient temperature. Under high temperature conditions, it'll be closer to four, up uh, to eight. Under cold conditions, it'll be closer to four. So it varies with that. The PCM is going to delay running vacuum, de the vacuum decay leak check with idle operation in crews for until the vehicle's been off for four to eight hours after shutdown. That means if you pull a car in or crank it up to check something and you want to take it for a test drive to get it to run the EVAP monitor, it's not going to happen. You're going to have to let it set four to eight hours, then take it for a test drive if you have any chance of seeing the leak check. However, we're going to show you ways of diagnosing much better than that. We're going to show you a number of different things, including a service bay leak check, which can be used for a 40,000th leak. Here's the enabling conditions from Ford. This is picked as a sample. It says the engine off soak time should be four to six hours. Some manufacturers say eight hours. It also says that engine coolant temperature at the startup and inlet air temperature are within 12 degrees of each other. That's making the assumption we know the temperature of the fuel. If we time since startup, it's not going to run until at least 330 seconds have expired, and it's going to have a maximum of 18, 1,800 to 2,700 seconds. It, that's the window where it's going to run. Intake air temperature at startup has to be between 40 and 95 degrees. In some cases, as high as 100. The altitude, we're not going to test at altitudes above 8,000 feet. If you're on Pikes Peak, it's not going to run the test. The engine load has to be between 20 and 70. We said it's not going to run at wide open throttle, so we get above 70, it's going to preclude it. Vehicle speed has to be 40 to 90 miles an hour. Well, I don't know how you can get to 90 miles an hour without going wide open throttle. Purge duty cycle is going to range between 75 and 100%. Purge flow is going to be 0.5 pounds per minute up to one-tenth of a pound per minute. That's calculated by looking at the purge system. And the fuel level has to be 15 to 85%. You say, why is it 15 to 85%? Well, if the tank is too full, over 85%, the airspace at the top is very small and makes the, the calculation for vacuum, vacuum decay very difficult. If the tank is so low, below 15%, it's mainly air with no fuel. It, again, is very hard to estimate how fast the vacuum decay should be. Now, fuel tank pressure can't be any more than a vacuum to start with, which worries us a little bit, minus 17 inches of water. Remember, that's less, it's a half a PSI. And typically not above 1.5 inches of pressure. 1.5 inches H2O, I should say, of pressure. So these are enabling conditions. This is what's going to have to happen before we're allowed to run the EVAP test. 
Remember, the EVAP test has nothing to do with normal purge. This is testing for leaks, two different functions. We have a service bay test. The service bay test can be run to check for a 40,000th leak. It's instituted and required after 2007. Now, most scan tools will run this under special test or bidirectional testing menu. Some vehicles have a waiver to provide a limited version of this test, so don't expect every single vehicle to do this same test. But you will have vehicles that will do it. It will be a, done in the first few minutes of a test drive, and it is easy to check. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go in here. Here's a test of onboard systems on the Auto Ingenuity Scan Tool. You notice there we're pointing with our red arrow. We've selected this EVAP service bay test, and we're ready to initiate it. When we initiate the service bay test, it starts telling us the RPM is being adjusted. Fuel level indicator, 75%. We still have that 15 to 85 criteria. The canister vent is closed, zero. Fuel vapor, zero. It's closed. We've been running four seconds. Engine RPM is 700, uh, 705 RPM. The fuel tank pressure voltage is 2.64. That's fairly typical for Ford. So it's going to go through, open, close the vent, open the vapor, vapor management valve on this Ford, and see how low this drops. If it doesn't drop low enough, it's going to give us a failure. In this particular case, the EVAP vacuum phase was not successful. And we're going to talk about all those phases later on in the program. It says EVAP check for large EVAP leaks or missing gas cap. This is our gross leak test. We're going to take you through and show you on a diagram what kind of pressures it's looking for through all the steps it's going to make. And it makes about a half a dozen steps looking for different things at different times. And we're going to talk about mode six. Now, here's something that's really beneficial. We can use bidirectional tests on our auto ingenuity, go in and we can check evaporative emissions canister vent. We can turn it off and on, meaning open and close it. Off is open, on is closed. We can then can go down and check emissions vapor management valve, run the percentage up, and at the same time we can watch scan tool and see what our fuel tank pressure sensor is doing. We can do that ourselves or we can run the automatic test, whichever one you want to use. But they're both are there. We're going to talk about test drives later on, so we're going to show you the purge activity. We're going to use scan data to measure the data used by the computer to control purge duty cycle. Purge should not cause any engine performance problems. It should bring in and compensate as it changes, and the PCM is going to correct the fuel vapors, correct for fuel vapors in the purge air to prevent this performance problem. So in the next segment, we're going to look at a number of different test drives because a test drive is a very efficient way to look at our system and to see if it's working normal.